Hi, everyone. Um, beer is absolutely appropriate for this talk, so make yourselves comfortable. Um, today's chat is really going to be sort of a punk rock history lesson to start. But what I really want to convey is how Kickstarter is here to be a, uh, a tool and resource for the entire music industry and how I think we can help strengthen the foundation in a really significant way. So my, my uh, career in music started about 25 years ago, and I never really had aspirations to be, um, have to be on the business side or really think that my career was going to be um, my full-time work as an artist. Um, I was informed and inspired by bands like Fugazi from my hometown in Washington, D.C., and bands that had a, a mission and a conscience about their art. Um, this was in the shadow of the political climate of the time, which was um, the, the first Gulf War. And so activism and creativity were kind of intrinsically um, in involved together for me as I got my start in music. Um, but I was also a student and learning about um, feminist theory and, and studying women's studies. And I recognized that there was a lack of women in music, both on stage and behind the scenes. And I wanted to both it, sort of embrace it and celebrate it, and I started a magazine to do so. And also, I wanted to start a band to um, sort of bring my voice to the table as well. And I did that um, without, again, any big aspirations, but, but it was something that was, we had so much passion for, and um, we started to write our songs and, and started our band, Bratmobile. And with that, we um, had I think we were learning as we went along. We weren't like people that had been playing in our bedrooms for our whole high school career. We were learning as we were going along, writing songs that were probably about a minute and a half tops. And um, after that, we got our offer to play our first show in uh, New York City. And we took the bus up and played with Friends Gear at a club in, uh, on the Lower East Side. And after playing our show, probably about 15 minutes long, Someone came up to me um, at the end of the set, and um, he said, hi, I'm Ken. I'm an A&R guy at Homestead Records, and would you like to do a record with us? And I was kind of shocked. Uh, I had no real idea that we would get anyone. We weren't thinking about making records at that time. We were just starting. But um, it was really flattering. Homestead Records was someone, a, a label that had put out lab artists like Big Black, Sonic Youth, Nick Cave even, and here we were, this like brand new punk rock band of three girls um, playing in our one of our first shows ever. So it was exciting, and we also didn't really have any thought at that time about being band, you know, being on any other label besides something that maybe our friends was putting up, were putting out. Our friends had their own records, record companies, or were putting out for friends' bands, and so that was maybe the only thing that we ever thought about. But it was still so early. But again, it was flattering and exciting, and. And we decided to, to go for it and um, recorded our first 7-inch. It was sort of like a little bit more mainstream than, than we were used to. There was a contract. Um, we didn't have a manager or a lawyer. And uh, we were sort of like a little bit spooked by the whole thing, but asked some friends for advice and then um, you know, found our way through it and uh, signed the contract, negotiating what we thought was an important term to keep the, the first recording available for our first album if we wanted to do it on another label. We thought that was pretty savvy and intuitive for us to negotiate. Um, and we got some attention for it. So we were uh, aff affiliated with a lot of other women doing things and being creative and making music and, and releasing records at the time. And it was called the Riot Girl Movement. And um, that got a lot of attention. And so we kind of navigated that through the way and ended up um, touring and releasing some other records and decided to record our first album. And um, I, another friend, uh, a guy named Slim Moon, who um, was starting Kill Rockstars Records, asked us if we wanted to put our album out on the label. And it was perfect for us. And we were going to be the first ar artist that was going to release a full-length album. And um, it, was, it was very flattering and exciting. And Kill Rockstars went on to release um, records by artists like Sleater Kinney and Elliot Smith and Bikini Kill. It's become part of the music lexicon now. Um, but that was just when it was getting started. And, and they didn't have any money, and we didn't either. So again, we went to our friends from our community and, and asked them to record our, our record. This was Tim Green from the Nation of Ulysses. He had a home studio with a four-track reel-to-reel. Um, and so we recorded an album in one night, um, for, and we paid him in uh, pizza 
and a box of hair dye. So it was like important um, uh, co currency at the time. And, and it sounded very lo-fi, but the energy is there. And, and all of that energy is what we kind of took with us as we started our band. Um, we kept touring for the next year. We released the album. But being in our early 20s and sort of not having a lot of support, like I was talking about, um, things started to go south a little bit. And we ended up not surviving. We, we broke up in a very dramatic fashion uh, at probably the biggest show we had ever headlined in New York. And um, there was Joan Jett in the audience and, and Sonic Youth and, and other celebrities to us. And it ended up being sort of, you know, something that was terrible and dramatic and awful and imploded. And, and this is the point where I think about what if a tool and resource and technology like exists today had been available? What if artists getting their start had resources to connect the community and energy that we had to have a sustainable model? And, and that just wasn't in, uh, available to us, and, and it wasn't something that, that we thought about. But th this is what sort of informs my work now at, at Kickstarter. So, Bratmobile breaking up kind of led me to my next world, and that was Lookout Records um, in Berkeley, California. So I got a job there. Um, they were ex experiencing ex explosive growth at that point, um, thanks to Green Day's uh, new, new album that was being released on Warner Brothers Records. But look at how it had the, had the catalog. So for two albums of Green Day's catalog were selling like hotcakes, like 50,000 records a week were going out the doors, and, and they couldn't really keep up. And they also had other artists who were on the label who were saying, what about me? I, I, you know, they used to open for me. What do I do now? So I came in to do sort of marketing and press and radio and A&R and, &R and help those other bands. And, and that was something that I felt I had connection to since I had been on the other side. My, my band had had a lot of attention. Um, this is something that I could parlay into a, a, a career, if you will. And, um, and it was fascinating time and, and, and really exciting. Because Green Day and other bands like them, uh, Rancid, Fugazi, The Offspring, were selling all of a sudden hundreds of thousands of records. And, and they were selling some of them millions. And, and this, these were CDs, so if you, if you know anything about the music business, and, and the last um, talk sort of referenced it, you know, when the CD format was a really high margin product, it was, you could make a lot of money selling them. They were cheap to make, and they, you, you could sell them at a good price. And um, so that was the sort of context of everything that was happening at the time. And people were looking for, for the next Screen Day, the next Nirvana, major labels were signing artists from the independent labels, and independent labels were trying to do things to keep up, and some of them could, and some of them were really challenged by it. Um, a lot of the bands that got, ended up getting signed by major record companies in the mid-90s, if you think about Jawbox or, or Girls Against Boys or Jawbreaker, sort of iconic independent bands and really influential, but they didn't survive um, being on a major. They might have negotiated creative control in their contracts, but that and what a major's profit motivation, you know, major business objectives don't really mesh together very well. And a lot of those bands either got dropped or, you know, broke up or, you know, went back to independent labels. And, and here's just a graph to try to, like, illustrate what this, the music business has been through. And this is an industry-generated industry graph, so I, I can't even take credit for it. But it's, it really demonstrates, you know, the, the apex and, and the peak of the record industry. And in 2000, it was valued at $37 billion. Um, and, and the context of, of everything that we went through in the 90s was there was a ton of interest, a ton of support for artists. Everybody was being creative. Labels were taking risks. Um, artists were taking risks. And, and it was working for a while. And then it fell off a cliff. And that was something that the label that I had, Lookout Records, really kind of didn't navigate well through unforced errors of our own, through not anticipating the business, not knowing how to, to maneuver into the digital age properly, and not how, knowing how to respond to the many things that artists were requesting of us. Um, unfortunately for artists and the label transaction, belief equals money. So if you don't support my creativity, you're you're not writing that check. Or if you do, that's, that's how you demonstrate that belief and, and passion for the artist. And it's not really a great dynamic. And again, this is, this is industry-generated numbers. But you know, what, what the, the record industry now, the, the IFPI, will tell you is that it costs $2 million to break an artist in a major market. And they spend $4.5 billion a year, or 27% of their annual revenues, on 
artist development and, and the equivalent of research and development in under in other industries. And, and, and that, what that breaks down to when you look at it next to other categories of business is that the music business over invests in research and development. And, and obviously, the music business doesn't generate the revenues of, of these other industries like technology, pharmaceutical, aeros, aeronautics, et cetera. Um, so we, you know, how can we, what would it look like for having a different kind of investment scheme and, and, and a different type of relationship to artist development? And I, again, I think back on, on what I went through in my company and the investment that we were asked to make and, and it ultimately not being successful. If we had opportunities that are available like we have at Kickstarter, would we have been able to maybe weather those storms a little bit more healthily and, and survive ultimately? Because at Kickstarter, we've had 25,000 successful projects in the music category only. That's the most of any of the of 15 different categories that we have on the platform. We've had $190 million pledged to music projects and from 2 million people. So we're serving the artists that are developing and getting their start. About 90% of the, of the projects that are successful on music on Kickstarter have raised about less than $20,000. But these are really important foundational times for those artists. They have the resources, they're able to connect with their community, and they're learning how to speak in a really important way. And, and some of these artists are, are really wonderful. This is a, a band that got their start on, on the subway, and they went on to raise $100,000 on the platform, and, and Beyonce had them play with her at an award show last year. There's another artist named Julia Nunes who, who got her start on YouTube and then has run three projects on Kickstarter. She's not even 30 years old and she's already had a really strong foundation. I think her last project raised about $70,000. And she's able to use her community consistently to have a really strong position and creative point of view and freedom for her projects. And an artist, um, Jack Stratton from, from the group Wolfpack, who's done seven projects on Kickstarter. I don't think he could really do anything else at this point, but he's, he's had five that were successful, two that weren't, so that was some good learning for him. But it was an important way for him to see, you know, and demonstrate that he has community and have to complete creative autonomy. And now we're working with, with uh, legacy artists and career artists. So artists like Ted Leo, who's been on some of the best independent record companies there are, but now using his project that he just ran on Kickstarter, he raised 160,000 plus dollars. And he said that the, the energy that he got from the, from the campaign made him remember that he could make music because he loved it again, because the dynamic that he had had with some of the record companies just wasn't supporting him anymore. And, and an artist like Kate Nash, who similarly has a really rabid fan base and, and people who are supporting her and, and wanted to be connected to her, she asked them to be her label. And, and they came out for her and she had a tremendous success with her recent project and raised about $150,000. And, and De La Soul ran a project two years ago, um, so obviously an iconic hip-hop band, um, raised $600,000 from 11,000 people and, and sort of recharged their career. They, this album that was released in, in August of last year was nominated for a Grammy. It was number one on the rap charts in the U.S. It was a whole new era for them as, as artists. And Kickstarter music well, you know, can't be um, anything without the success that we had um, years ago with Amanda Palmer. For, for many years, the only album that, or project that raised over a million dollars. And really, she's such a unique artist, but it set the foundation for her future career that really allowed her the freedom and the cre to be creative along her own terms. And finally, this is a project that um, I'm, I think is a really fascinating business case. It's, it's an album project that came out last year. It ended up raising $1.3 million. Um, this is a brand new label that wanted to release, as many people had had the Id I uh, idea to do, um, the music that was in the Voyager Golden Record that went up with the Voyager Spacecraft 40 years ago. And the license were very expensive and, and somewhat prohibitive, but what these guys did was go to the community to get the money in advance, secure the licenses, and the package will be coming out this summer. And it's something that so many people have wanted for so many years, and I think it's a really in impressive and wise business case. The investing comes from the community, and it's very healthy that way. And, and finally, you know, these are the themes that I think about all the time. For the music business, 
empowering artists is critical. And as, as the last presentation mentioned, you know, streaming is, is here. The you know, consumption model is how things work right now. But what we offer is a way to engage people that really care about music and really, really want to support artists. And from that, gives them the foundation to have as much strength, as much control, and as much leverage as they can in their career, and makes a wiser investment for the industry and the, the people a, a whole, a, all along the chain. So those are the things that I want to lead you with, leave you with, and thank you so much. Thanks, Molly.